keep your roots, stay there. And, and then from that launch pad, you know, take your satellite dish to the All Things Are Possible network, shoot it up to the sky and uh, do your part, work hard. You know, the, the, the dots will connect. And I heard a great thing one time about like, well, why isn't this happening for me? Like, why, you know, why is my M9, why aren't things opening up? Well, sometimes the stage is being set in your life. Like, like, like why, why the curtains aren't opening for me yet? Well, they actually, the stage is being set. Like this guy has to meet this guy. This guy has to write this thing. This guy has to raise this kind of money. This guy's got to do this. And all that's happening on the stage, but you have to be ready. Just trust the process, man. There's a lot of moving parts to your dream in any capacity, whether it's this industry or anything. I'm here today with William Zabka, who frankly requires no introduction, but if like his character, Johnny Lawrence, you've just recently been introduced to this thing called the internet. Billy is currently the star of the hit Netflix series, Cobra Kai, alongside, of course, his partner in crime, Ralph Macchio, who shameless promotion was also recently, recently a guest on the podcast. Uh, Billy, you are also widely known as the quintessential bad guy bully character from all of the best 80s movies, including Back to School, Just One of the Guys, and of course, obviously, The Karate Kid. However, the reason that we are here today is that we're going to chat about the Renaissance man, Billy Zapka, who is also a screenwriter, a director, a producer, a musician. And by the way, this one's really going to perk up the ears of my listeners. You're also an editor. I'm just absolutely dying to dig into all of that and more. But first of all, long time coming, lots of emails back and forth, lots of scheduling conflicts. We're finally... Finally on Zoom, can't thank you enough for your time. Awesome, thanks so much, Zach. Good to be here. Finally, yeah, many many uh, seasons we'll be like, we got to do this, we got to do this, and now's a sweet spot. So uh, it's good to good to do this with you, man. Yep. So now we're finally here, and the the place that I want to start is I think that um, it's going to be a similar place that I had to start when I first joined the show, and I think the impression that so many people have is, and I'm gonna basically I'm gonna quote Mark Maron because he nobody has put it any better than Mark Maron in his interview with you. He discovered Cobra Kai, and he said that the way that Billy was playing this washed up, old, broken Johnny Lawrence, he got it right, and he got it right so quickly, I just assumed that this had to be his life. And when you watch both what you did with Johnny as a kid, and now Johnny as an adult in Cobra Kai, you're just like, I mean, he's got to be like this, right? Because it just it feels so real and authentic. So let's just start the conversation by decoupling Johnny yeah. Lawrence from Billy Zabka, because they're worlds apart. Johnny is, he's, he's like, um, he's my alter ego. And he's also, he's as far as the East is from the West, as far as who I am in real life. So yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, Mark was great. Um, the, the way I played Johnny in the Karate Kid was, you know, he's 18 years old and I was the, the, the antagonist and I had to have a view of, you know, where that came from. And I gave him a backstory of, he had no father and Kreese was his sensei and he, he was his father's mentor, but he was never a bad guy. Like I always thought like he was misled. So the way I could do it as Billy Zapka, when I read the Karate Kid script, I was like, okay, I'm never going to get this. First of all, I don't know karate. I never rode a motorcycle. Um, he's a jerk. He's a jerk. He's a jerk. And then when I get to the last page, when Kreese says sweep the leg and then he doesn't want to, he's, he's reluctant. And then uh, at the end when he hands him the trophy. And so those are the two like points in the story in the script where I'm like, oh, that's Johnny. And that's the part of me that I can kind of step into the skin of this guy. And I got to reverse engineer him and kind of play the antagonist against uh, the hero until the end. And then of course, take the kick. So like from the beginning, I always had to put, I'm like, okay, so the seed of this guy is an evil. He's not through and through bad. So that's the, that's the, that's the soul of Johnny. And Johnny was just built by the way he was raised by a stepdad and um, didn't have the father figure and through experiences. But now we've got Cobra Kai, 30 years of life, which I've lived. So I bring all 30 years of my road, my off road in my Jeep and through the through the wilderness and to the mountaintops and through the deserts and all those things, you know, and I get and I've experienced those things. And then and I get to play him. So Billy is is that much more evolved. So now I can take some of the those compressed, painful, real experiences I've had in my life and and beautiful experiences in raising a godson and um, who didn't have a father and, um, you know, just all that, you know, the, the all that and bring it into Cobra Kai and just sit in that. So, um, yeah, it's a, you know, listen, acting is 
is about identifying the piece of the character that is you and you that is him and then you know compartmentalizing that and shoving the rest of it away and sitting in that pocket and then the trick of doing that is after a long time because it takes a while to get comfortable we're like literally resting in that and trusting that and you know and take a chance and go you know so i remember season one like in the in the uh episode where he walks in into the dealership to see daniel for the first time and how daniel's like hey you know this is a guy who kicked his ass and and everybody's goofing on him and there was different ways to go and he's like hey johnny how are you it's like he could have fronted and been like hey man i'm good i'm good but the the more the more bigger chance was to sit in the pocket of kind of the down part of that and be just more in the belly and more honest and um, so a uh, little bit of both is you know you bring you know it's it's acting um, but uh, yeah and then that set the tone for the show for me was really those scenes and the only way that I knew that they were working was by hearing the the creators the producers or writers behind the lens behind the monitors laughing their asses off in the back room and i'm like okay so as much as this is painful for me and for johnny this is working and um so yeah it's uh he's nothing like me i'm not the you know i i don't drink the <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that guy but <laughs> but i know that guy and in the sense is you know as i've played him since i've been you know a kid i've been he's my other other half in a weird way um you know, I know him very well and I, and I try to not play him. I don't play him. I, I am him. I, I find those pieces and that's part of my process is to push out Billy. I always say when I come back from a season that, you know, there's 2% of me that remains and I have to decompress and reconnect to, to all the other synapses in my world, my family, my friends, and, you know, and kind of purge Johnny out of me. And the writers take me on this crazy journey that I dive into with my whole heart and mind. And you got to do it this way and trust it in your hands at the end. You know, well, I'm, and I'm super glad that you brought that up, because uh, as I had mentioned to you before, and for anybody that kind of doesn't know the super brief version of how I ended up in this universe, um, randomly see a thumbnail in the sidebar of YouTube, thanks to the algorithm knowing me well, saying, check out this trailer for this new show called Cobra Kai. And I'm like, you have got to be shitting me. How dare they? How are they going to take my childhood dreams, right? Like the Karate Kid was my Star Wars and they're going to destroy it. Because so many of these other 70s and 80s properties were being destroyed. Watch the trailer and I'm like, oh, this actually looks pretty good. Okay, fine. I'm going to hate watch the pilot because there's no way it's as good as the, the trailer. Hate watch. Hate, wa hate watch the pilot. And of course, by the end of it, I'm just like, okay, so I'm going to have to block out the rest of my day and I must watch all of this. And I finished season one in one viewing, like I think most of the universe did when they discovered it as well. And I stared at the screen as the credits were rolling for the end of episode 110. And I said, oh, I'm editing this show. There is no question that I will be editing the show because this is my childhood and my life and I must be a part of this. And it wasn't just, this would be awesome. It's, I knew that I could actually bring value to the show. So fast forward to anybody that wants to hear the in-between there, I've got a 90 minute conversation with the three creators of the show talking about from that moment of discovery to landing on the, the job. But I get there and my first day I'm like, I'm watching raw dailies of Ralph Macchio and Billy Zapka playing Daniel and Johnny. And this is absolutely surreal. But what I discovered very, very quickly is number one, how in character and how intense you are and how well prepared you are. But then as soon as you decouple just for a second, I'm like, whoa, Billy's totally different than Johnny. It was almost like this weird, surreal experience. Um, so the a couple of things that I noticed right off the bat is that you have an intense level of attention to detail. You really dive into it. And I know that you mentioned this idea of getting into the, the belly of the character. And another, uh, another uh, common theme or phrase that you use that I want to talk more about, because it's going to apply not just to the character, but how we build the character of who we want to be in the world, is this idea of finding your anchor. So talk to me a little bit more about how you find your anchor, both as a character, but then we're going to, as we go on, talk more about how to really do that as ourselves, as people, too. Interesting. Yeah. And they, <clears throat> you know, that, that anchor, that, that kind of metric, that, that sink line that you need in your life to keep that balance and everything, you know, you have to know that first of all, before you even step into a character, you, you, you should better, hopefully as an actor, have that in your own life. Otherwise you're just blown in the wind. So, so first, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm anchored in my life, in my real world, in my family, my values, 
um, you know, what's important to me, um, you know, who gets my time and attention, those things. And, and so you got to know that first. And, and then when you have your own self put together as best as you can, then, then you can go ahead and carve up, you know, another, another character. And that's, what's so great. I'm out. I was always, when I was a kid, they, they used to call me Dr. Z as a kid in like, you know, youth groups and camps and things like that. Cause I was always, I could always kind of sense, I was like empathetic to people and I always could see through other people's eyes. So if someone had a problem, it's like, go talk to Dr. Z, even when I was 14 years old, you know, and I would like, you know, and many times on river raft trips, I'm talking to the kid that's, you know, going through something and always kind of helping and like that. So, um, I have an empathy for, for people. And so with Johnny, especially since I, I'm so close to him and, and, and love him and he's, he's broken and the, the stuff that the writers throw at me, I remember in season one, when they were pitching me the show and they're like, okay, so he lives in a apartment and he, you know, he drinks Coors Banquet and, and, you know, and I'm like, well, where's, where's the rest of the Cobras? They're like, oh no, they're not here yet. And I'm like, does he have any friends? They're like, no. I mean, does he have a girlfriend? No. I'm like, well, can he have a fish? Like, what is it? <laughs> isolated in this world. So, so now I've got this core of who Johnny is. Cause I know him so well from the beginning, I've got these 30 years of, of life as a person. And then they're writing in this backstory and then it's my job to kind of narrow down and go, okay, so where's the belly of this guy and what's important to him. And, and, um, you know, and of course I come from the era of the eighties and the music and all that. It was really easy and fun. And it's cathartic to go back to those times without knowing what the internet is. And, you know, with the, just the more simple kind of basic, you know, blue collar dude, just trying to go out there and make a, make a buck and, uh, you know, carrying wounds from his past. Um, so you find those things and, and one way that I really do that, and I, it's been this way my whole life, even in my own life is there's like theme songs, there's music that speaks to me. Like, I think for everybody, we all have our songs from the eighties and, you know, the nineties, whatever, but there's something about those, those songs that fill me up that I find inspiration. So, um, Johnny has his own soundtrack in my head. So I will like, I'll read the script and I'll find some music that goes along with that scene in my head. For instance, uh, in season one, when at the end before the tournament, um, and Johnny goes in a circle and tells the kids, you know, we're badass, you're Cobra Kai. It's this kind of like circle thing. And, um, and I heard the symphony behind it, this kind of more orchestral kind of grandiose moment of inspiration as misguided as it was, you know, now let's go out there and kick the shit out of everybody. Right. But you got it, you know, so, so music helps me connect with that. And even though they filled it in with like some hard rock acid song or something, you know, but for me as an actor, it's like, you know, that's such a fun part of the discovery is finding those anchors. And I find that through music. I find that through, of course, working with the other actors and how they're they're bouncing off, like working with Ralph is great for that. And every all the a whole cast, really. So well, one of the things that I think now helps me even better understand why I gravitated to you and now vice versa, why you're seeing a lot of similarities is right. that I, too, have a, a, almost an extreme level of empathy where it can be a superpower. It can also emotionally be even a kryptonite to be very draining. But the reason that I've developed the podcast, the coaching program, the educational materials is because of my level of empathy for those that are struggling to design a career path or deal with all the the requirements and the, the crazy expectations in this industry and i think nice i love it my playlist right now dude you said kryptonite. Oh this is what I'm with today hold on come on yeah isn't that crazy yeah so man, it's a, a, essentially um the the reason that i'm doing all of this is because like you i once you made it to a certain level you can either um enjoy the the spoils of your labor and realize how miserable life is when you're just focused on the money and the cars and the awards and everything else or you can decide to give back and yeah. there's a, a moment that i maybe you remember but you probably don't because for you it's just another day at the office but for me it was a really quintessential moment that said and it might have been the kernel of okay now it's time to start emailing billy incessantly because i need <laughs> to get him on the podcast and it was when we were screening the uh season four finale of Cobra Kai on the big screen at the Dolby Theater. And there was a panel for it afterwards. I think it was during like the, the four year consideration um, uh, period. And I was super excited about it because episode 410 just about leveled and killed me in the editing room. But it's also one of the things I'm most proud of in my entire career. But what is really important to me is that there was this moment right near the end of it where, and by the way, Dolby Theater was full. I mean, it was absolutely packed to the gills, all three levels. And this kid comes up near the end and he says, Billy, I'm a big fan. 
can we take a picture together? And you're like, yeah, man, let's do it. And then security is like, no, sorry, we can't even come up to the stage. He's like, all right, we're going to make it happen. You come up, you find me afterwards, and you're going to leave with that picture. You don't need to do that, right? You do this all day, every day, but there was something about your character that led me to believe there's something different in you than whatever the perception is. And following you on social media and seeing you at all the, the comic cons and everything else, you're in a position now with the level of fame you've attained you have no business being this nice to people, but it goes back to finding your anchor really? and knowing who you are. Right. 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 Well, it's about never letting go of who you are. And it's mm -hmm. about, listen, man, this, the, the scenery changes around you. Like it's almost like a virtual reality in some ways. Like, you know, like you, it's sink or swim sometimes in this, in this business, it's deserts and it's mountains in this business and it's, it's ups and downs and you can't believe either of them. You can't be, you can't let your circumstances tell you who you are or dictate how you should feel about yourself or how you're doing. You know, even the, I don't believe the lows and I don't believe the highs. Um, it's not even about that. It's not even about anything perception wise. It's like, you know, you just have to know who you are and, and you're getting out of it that you love to do this and, you know, and keep your feet on the ground and, um, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like amazed by that. And I, I recognize the position that I have with, especially with, with the young people and with kids, because I have a real big heart for kids in general. I have my two of my own kids. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, my, my father is in the industry. My dad was the associate director of the tonight show. He met my mom on the tonight show. I was raised in the industry and, but I was on sets all my life. Like I was at NBC studios in New York when I was five years old, walking around through the doctors of uh, soap opera, uh, checking out the fake drinks and all this stuff. But along the way, I met some incredible people. Like I remember my dad did a movie with Chuck Norris called Force Vengeance. And I was just a, a young kid. And I got to go and watch him do a flying psychic through a window or something. I remember being on set years before Karate Kid and just how, you know, how much I looked up to him and how, how he was a star. I was so, and he, he was just so real and he just got down on my level and made me feel so warm. Another time I was 14 years old, I was a stand in on a movie called The Island that Michael Ritchie directed starring Michael Caine and David Warner at Universal Studios. And I was the guy that they set the lights on. My dad was an AD on that. And Michael Caine and David Warner were these big movie stars. And they every morning, hello, hello, son, how are you? And I remember though, I remember those for the rest of my life. And, the, you know, just how good they were. And it's like, wow, it's, it's sometimes you pinch yourself saying, wow, I'm that guy that is some of these kids, right? You know, sometimes I'm not in the mood to be super overly accessible. But I can tell when a kid is you know, has the look in their eyes that I had when I was their age. And I'm going to do everything in my power to break through that wall and go, no, 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 no. This is all illusion, dude. Like I'm still Billy. You're you. I was you. You can do what you want to do. Like I'm always encouraging kids and, and adults, but especially, especially kids that are being molded and finding their way in this world that, you know, dream big. Um, your limitations are your own and, you know, and, you know, and go for it. Dream big. You know, there are no, there are no limit. Our limitations really are our own. You know, we work, we could be our own worst enemy in so many ways. So for me, the trick is always to, even before something good is here, a Cobra Kai or a movie or a, anything, um, it's already, it's already happening. It just hasn't, it just hasn't landed yet. Like I already have it. The, the next, the next project, the next thing is already in the, in the tank. It's just, it hasn't appeared yet, you know? And when I look back in my life or my career, and I can remember times where it's like, dude, well, you know, I'm not getting booked on anything. And, you know, this isn't working. And, you know, there's these long periods of drought, but then another mountaintop will come. And then there's another drought and then there's a mountaintop. Well, if I could stand on the mountaintop and look back and I could see all the peaks the whole way, then I'd be like, I have nothing to worry about in those desert times because I know it's coming. So you have to live in your, in your heart, even though your circumstances, you may be struggling, you may be, you know, I'm um, discouraged, all those things, but really to do it in this business, like you have to have a laser beam focus and you have to have a faith in a, in yourself and a belief in, you know, a, the universe is going to come and bring you some, uh, something. So, you know, he's going to, you're going to almost not manifest your dreams, but you have to have it inside you. So yeah. I don't know.
Yeah. I think I think it's got to be a combination of the two because there's, as I'm sure you know, uh, uh, even better than I do in this industry, there's so much of that, oh, just manifest it and the secret says that it will happen. Create your vision board, sit back and watch all your dreams come true. Total mm-hmm. bullshit. Mm-hmm. But then there's the other That's side, right. which is just you just grind and you work hard and you put you grind yourself into dust and eventually that'll happen. And yeah. I don't think just that works either. It's the combination of the two where it's, I have a very clear vision. I know where I want to go, but I'm willing to embrace all of the discomfort, all of the setbacks backs like you said i'm willing to to live in the valleys knowing that the peaks are going to come it's one it's one thing to say that it's another thing to totally live it so this is going to be a little bit of a a transition now to a world that i'm guessing most people are unaware of is that you're also an oscar nominee and you uh, wrote and produced a short film and my assumption is if i go on youtube and put in you know billy zapka short film it's going to be this fun zany action comedy you know with like this cool character and all of a sudden you're like oh this must be the wrong thing because this has subtitles and it's european this 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 can't be the same billy zapka can it so talk to me about the process of making your short film and specifically leading to this idea of i don't care about the setbacks because i'm in the future and i'm at this screening already right right for sure well to kind of go along with the other part as far as like when i was talking about the valleys and stuff like it's not just an acting like you know i i didn't set out to be you know a uh, you know, just an actor. I, I went to film school before I was cast of the Karate Kid, so I didn't go to acting school. So I wanted to be a filmmaker. I, since I was 10 years old, I had a film, eight millimeter film camera in my hand. And so for me, and, and one thing my dad told me and taught me when I was young, I think it's an old Confucius saying is, you know, uh, uh, if, if you do what you love to do and you'll never work a day in your life. And so for me, c- expressing myself creatively, I'm as fulfilled um, creatively and as a person, uh, you know, acting or writing or producing or directing anywhere in the wheelhouse of that. I just knew I was going to be a storyteller, whether through a character. So, um, yeah, so I was, uh, I went and did a a short film, uh, just based on a story I heard when I was 14 years old that impacted me and changed my life. And, um, my a partner, um, came to me and said, Hey, uh, I heard this story and I think we should make it into a short film. And, I said, that's, I, I know that story well. I've told it a thousand times. And uh, so we went out and set off to Europe to go make this film. And it was just shortly after 9-11, like weeks after that, we went on this location scout when nobody was flying. It was really scary to be in the air. We had a little bit of money from somebody to go and make the short film. And we ended up scouting all through Eastern Europe, like eight countries and, and landed in Prague. And we should filmed it in Poland, cast it as a Czech cast. And it was a labor of love for two years, um, three years afterwards, you know, we had an insurance battle, went back. It's about a man in a drawbridge. Um, and that was a whole other, you know, it's a part of my, um, part of my uh, heart and character that you know, most people don't get to see, but I got, I loved telling that story. I was going to be in it. And then I thought, you know, I mean, I was going to be on the train or somewhere. And as we were getting forward, I said, you know, I can't put myself on this canvas. I need to be on the other side completely. I think I'll interrupt my own story if I'm in it. And um, so, yeah, and then we went and it went and opened doors and, you know, a few years later, we're walking the red carpet, the Academy Awards. It's really a miracle making this movie because um, it was, we went out with the faith that we were, it was going to get funded, but we didn't have all the money. And we went out and we cast all these amazing top stars in the Czech Republic. We rented 1930 steam trains from Poland. Um, we we had crews on alert. We were staying in flats in Prague that we couldn't afford. They were turning the lights off while we're texting and typing, trying to get more funding from people at home and through a series of events. Um, it worked out and we were able to make this movie and filmed in negative 11 degrees on a drawbridge in Poland while flying <laughs> steam trains are coming across. And the moment you're referring to, um, is while we were at the bridge in in Poland and we had worked for th- two and two and a half months. It's now winter. It's Christmas. It's like December 2nd. It, really cold. And we went to go and rent a steam train to come from Warsaw, Poland to Chechen, Poland. And they told us it was going to cost thirty five hundred dollars a day for the uh, for the train and all the cars and everything. We went to pick it up and they said, no, we didn't say thirty five hundred. We said thirty five thousand. So now we're in our post-production budget and we're kind of getting r- literally railroaded from this thing. Anyway, the train gets to the bridge. We're there. We're finally set to get our first shot and this bridge snaps and breaks. And it's $35,000 a day to stay at this bridge while they figure it out. So we were supposed to be there for one day. We end up staying there for three days and they never fix it. 
So we're shooting everything around it. We're manually opening and closing the strawbridge. And we're like, well, we have to go and get insurance money and come finish this. And there's a moment that's on, I think you saw on YouTube where, I mean, I, this is months in the making and getting a crew from Prague through Germany into Poland and a steam train in Poland. And this whole event's happening at a bridge and, and it breaks. But in that moment, it, you know, it was like, you have to sometimes will things through and believe things through. And, um, and even though we were in the middle of the trenches right there and all odds were against us, I wasn't freaked out. And I was like, you know, I know that, you know, I'm, I'm not here at the bridge right now. I'm, I'm at the screening and I've just stepped back into time. And, and this is our situation right now. So I guess, you know, play the result, like see the result, envision the result, um, have faith in that. And, uh, you know. Yeah, it's it's one thing to to say the words. It's another thing to live them, and that was kind of the the real moment where I'm like, "Yep, that that's the heart of this conversation." Because you can tell that story when you're giving an Oscar speech or you're at an Oscar lunch. And, oh, you know, we we knew we had to push through adversity, and we knew we get here. But we're watching this video of you saying, "Oh no, the film's already done, and I'm at the screening." But the bridge doesn't even work yet, and you haven't gotten the most important pivotal moment of your entire story that you've been working for for years. And the look on your face was like. Pfft, this is totally going to be fine. Like what? And it was just like, there, there's just this, this stoic level of I am going to push through to achieve my goals, no matter what it takes. Yeah. That was so inspiring. Yeah. 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 It's blind faith. Listen, it, it hurt. You know, we ended up going to having, having an insurance battle. So we called this insurance company and, and they said, no, it's, it's covered. Don't worry about it. So we felt like, okay, let's get out of Poland and go finish our movie in Prague and then go home and file our claim. We go home and file our claim. And within an hour, they sent it back and said, sorry, it's not insured. And we're like, you told us it was now we had to battle them for six months and from a little office and we're sending them like emails after emails. And finally, I went through the insurance contract and found a loophole. We also had a generator go down on one of the trains. I'm like, oh, wait, one of our generators went down. We couldn't light this train car. And that affected our movie as well. So we sent them a Hail Mary and said, listen, you know, we're in really deep on this. Our 10 year old boy is getting bigger. It's now summer. Um, we have nothing better to do than to go after you for the for what we've lost and all the future gains of this film, unless you, you know, so then within 24 hours, they wired the money for us to go back. But we went back in the summertime and now the trees are all green. Nothing matched. The lighting was wrong. We rented two fire engines to be on the other sides of the bridge to wet it down just so it could match. And we stood on the bridge and we just kind of like prayed. We're like bringing the clouds, bringing the rain and hadn't rained all summer. And no doubt, five o'clock in the morning, in comes this mist over the bridge. And the and the light temperature was exactly the same through our DP's lens. And we could we sent the fire trucks home and we captured the ending of this movie in the middle of summer and cut it together seamlessly. And so, and then to to show more of the adventure of that, it was quite the adventure. After we finished that at the, at the bridge, we drove back through through Germany to Paul, to Prague got our flat, had all our film there. And at like two in the morning, we had our transpo guy pounding on our door. It's like, Billy, Bobby, you've got to wake up. The worst flood in a hundred years is coming through. It hasn't <laughs> stopped raining since the bridge. No kidding. It was a hundred year flood. And the, our road from Prague to Dresden was underwater. Like all these tr bridges along the way were, are they letting the animals go out of the zoo? They're like, you got to leave the city. We're like, well, we have all our film cans here. Like, we can't leave our stuff here. So he's like, well, there's this place is going to go under. He goes, there's another flat across the bridge we can get you into. But everybody's leaving it. So we are like, oh, take us there. So we put all our film cans. We shot on a film, drive across the bridge. We walk up to this to this flat where there's a guy with the big mustache and they're sandbagging the outside of the thing. People are checking out with their luggage. And, and me and my partner, Bobby, walk in. And we're like, hey, do you have any rooms? He goes, of course we have rooms. And they were like, is it be safe? He says, of course it's going to be safe. And so we ended up staying there for like three or four nights and, and Prague was in a blackout. It looked like Gotham city. And we were, you know, so it's kind of an adventure. Like there's another part in that story where it's like, you know, you know, uh, if this didn't happen, like what story, if everything, what's, what's the story, everything went great. What story is that? You know? So the, the, the journey is the destination, I think, you know, ultimately. And, you know, it's not like you got to get somewhere, like you are somewhere. And make that your make that your destination. Make that your journey. Embrace all of that. Stay connected to all of that.
Yeah, and, that's that's what uh, what I like to call a, a mic drop moment. Um, total, totally hit the the nail on the head there, and it's funny because that's one of the core foundations of everything that I teach in my program. Which clearly I did not come up with myself. There's thousands and thousands of years of teachings, whether it's Stoics or Buddhists or Confucius or whomever else. But this, I, w w it's one thing to read the quote or say the quote. It's another to actually feel it in your bones, where you're like. It really is about the journey and the process and not the destination and realizing that, oh, I'm I'm struggling at the moment and the peak may be up there, but there's so much so many clouds and so much mist. I don't even know if the peak is there or not. And I'm just stuck here in the valley. But you just have to forge through and have faith that at some point that will come. And I would if uh, I basically want to frame that to talk about this big, giant gap, at least from the world's perspective, where. You're the quintessential 80s bully, movie, 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 and then giant gap, right? Some would say, oh, well, you know, it looks like the, the acting career didn't work out. And then all of a sudden you reemerge, you know, out of the phoenix, out of the ashes. But right. for somebody for somebody that embraces the process and is just creative and wants to be a filmmaker, the more they learn about that big giant gap where you, quote unquote, disappeared, there's a hell of a lot going on in there that was making you a better artist and a better creative. So talk to me about this gap that most people are unaware of because they always want to talk about Karate Kid. All right, now let's talk about Cobra Kai. There's yeah. a there's a lot more to Billy in that that giant gap. Yeah, sure. Well, that gap was awesome. Um, I remember there was a day I was doing movie after movie. I remember I just did a movie called The Tiger's Tale with Tommy Howell and Anne Margaret. Didn't get seen very Kelly Preston. Um, and I had, I had a meeting with a big agency and they surrounded me with scripts. It was one of those like, Hey, here's 10 things we think you're right for. And I remember walking down to the car. My dad had driven me there to this meeting. And I'm like, I said, I don't, I don't want to do it anymore. He's like, why? I'm like, it's because it's become work. It's become, it's become bigger than I imagine it being and more than I imagine it being. And it's not, I'm not, I'm not, I had this thing before I started where I was like, I I was craving it and I suddenly wasn't craving it anymore. And it was like, so what did I do? Like, I'm like, I went to music school and I play guitar. I've been playing guitar since I was 10 years old. And I went and graduated guitar school, this place called Dick Grove in, in LA and did that for a long time. I grew my hair long. I drove my Jeep around. I, I played my guitar and, you know, and, you know, and you're always thinking too, like, you know, listen, when you're, when you get a movie or 18 or karate kid and all of a sudden these things keep topping themselves, you kind of get this false security that that's always going to be there, right? Like I'm going to take a little break and go play the guitar and I'll just go back and then I'll pick it up, you know, but time marches on, you know, I went from playing the teenage kids, to the college kids. And then it was like transitioning into the adult thing for me was a little tricky. And because, especially because these movies were, you know, European vacation and back to school and just one of the guys and karate kid, they were, they were kind of, like you said, I became known as a quintessential eighties jerk, you know, and that was how I was kind of being crystallized. Um, if, if, if tiger's tail played better, it would have been different because they played this kind of fun football guy. Anyway, you just, it's not only about like, it's also self-discovery and what you, who you, what fulfills you. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be an actor, you know? And again, I didn't set out to be, um, I never set out to be, you know, what's happened has been extraordinary. It's been way beyond my, my imagination. You know, I love it. I was telling you last night too, we were talking a little bit on the phone and I'm like, you know, I would be just as content and sometimes maybe even happier if I could go do the work that I do. Cause I love it so much. And, you know, and if nobody ever saw it, it's so fulfilling for me, you know? So I like to go where, um, you know, where I'm alive, where I feel edified where I feel like I'm being useful and creative and like with the editing, you know, I got, I did a, f a lot of editing. I did a lot of music videos and, and a couple documentaries. And I spent almost a year with four or five terabytes of footage from Uganda from a lady that was going there. And I, I was at home cutting this thing for months and months and you know what that's like. But I mean, if you get, if you get a footage with no script right and you basically have to watch first you got to watch all that stuff then you got to you know mark it and put it everywhere and then you start to put a thing together all that was just as fulfilling to me i mean i love doing that um 
Yeah. And then, um, so, you know, and you don't know what's ahead. It wasn't like, you know, it's like, I didn't know Cobra Kai was coming, you know, I didn't know. Um, but I was just as happy then I was just as fulfilled then. And so I remember that. And so now that this is here, it's like, well, I'm the guy, I know who I am. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make a kid come up. I'm going to say, Hey, to a kid, I'm going to bump, bump fists and, you know, be as transparent as I can to other people and other artists, because we're all on this journey together and, you know, um, so like you, me, we're all part of the, the, this, this fabric that is, um, you know, and it's dependent on each other and, you know, so it's good. I love what you're doing. I was just so impressed to hear what you, what you're doing. I didn't get the whole full scope of it, but. Yeah. Which I appreciate. Cause I can assume from your perspective, you're like, God, the editor of the show just keeps emailing me. I'm like, fine, fine. I'll be in his yeah. podcast. And then you and I talk, you're like, Oh, Oh, I get it now. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to dig way deeper into how you ascertain what is a fulfilling project. What isn't. Cause I know you've had some, uh, some really good career advice about that. And I'm sure you have your own, but there's one kind of side note, cool piece of trivia that I have to share with people. That's basically singing your praises which is that uh, season two, my first season on the show, because uh, I wasn't on season one. It's the one regret that I'm going to have on my deathbed is, man, I wish I had discovered Cobra Kai and I could have done it from beginning to end. But, you know, still pretty fortunate I found it at the end of season one. Um, no, but but you were the, the, the way you came into it was perfect, though, because you were fully energized. Like you got, you know, you got pregnant with it. And you're like, I'm doing that. You know, yeah. if you came in from the beginning, you'd have been like, ah, this is going to be stupid. You know, and then, uh -huh. oh, you know what I mean? Like you came yeah, in. Exactly. And it, it, it ends up, you you know, becoming my dream job and the, the pinnacle of 20 years of my editing career. But the, the reason I bring that up is I want people to understand it's not just a matter of, oh, you dabble or you play with, you know, the the software and you do a little bit of editing near the end of season two, when we were just about ready to, to lock the season because we don't do it the way broadcast does. We kind of lock the whole thing as this big giant feature over the course of a few weeks and get this message one day like, oh, by the way, Billy's got some editing notes. And I'm like, does he now? Hmm. Cause I I've, I've gotten that's editing. That's like somebody saying Zach has some acting notes for you. I know what that's like. Right? <laughs> exactly. Hey, the editor probably could do this a little different. Maybe it'll yeah. cut better. Exactly. So, uh, so my first thought was, Oh, interesting. Cause I've, I've gotten editing notes from actors before. It's not that uncommon, especially ones that have been, not, been on a show for a while, have an executive producer credit. And by and large, the the note is always about, well, I thought that I looked better in this or I liked my pro it was all, always about them. And for you, I discovered very quickly that it was number one about the quality of that actual moment or that scene. But number two, you actually knew what you were talking about. And then some the two moments and this is just a side piece of Cobra Kai trivia are number one, you would cut your own version of the White Snake dream montage, the music video by literally taking your iPhone and shooting from the monitor and digitizing your own dailies, which just mystified me that you would go to that level. And then the other moment was there's this little like back alley, just not even really a fight, just kind of a skirmish where you take down this really smarmy British guy. Mm -hmm. And with both of those moments, they showed me the notes. I'm like, Shit, he's right. This is better. Right. And I switched it. But what the, the reason I bring that up is my belief is that the reason the show works so well is because everybody has the exact same way to approach it, which is that the best idea wins. It does not matter where it comes from. We're all very competitive, but there's no egos. It's we're just going to compete to find the best idea. And I think that all of us, whether it's you or Ralph or John or Josh or Hayden or me or anybody else on the team, we have this extreme level of perfectionism where we just want to get it right at all costs. In those two moments, I was like, all right, I'm a fan. You can give me notes anytime you want. Yeah. And I'm really careful about sending in notes because I learned really early on I, in one of the scenes that was cut out of the first season, which was the Br Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Did you ever see that? That that I haven't. I didn't even know, but I'm intrigued. OK, so there's a scene where where Johnny's trying to recruit some guys from a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu studio. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had some issues with the scene and I was talking to the guys about it and I got voted down. And I remember going home that night and like just realized that I have to surrender Johnny. Like, I'm like, okay, so Johnny isn't really mine anymore. Like it's all of our, he's all of ours, you know? So I'm, I'm always careful about that, but I do do that. I I'm constantly either I'm filming the monitors or somebody's doing it for me for myself. So then I'll, I'll go ahead and cut together like a fight sequence or just things just so I know for me that it's working. And rarely do I shoot that over to the guys to get to you guys. But, um, yeah, those two instances I think were, um, 
the, the music video was just so much fun. And I just had a black, I mean, it was fun to cut that together. So I did it as a gap. Actually. I didn't actually have that to be sent to you. I just showed the guys who so like, Oh, we're going to send this on. And I think the one, the alley fight, I think there was something I saw. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was just a timing thing with a couple frames um, which make a world of difference, you know, just like one frame changes, could change the whole DNA of the whole piece, the whole sequence. So I'm always watching for that. And there was also a, you didn't do on, on the, oh no, it was season. You know what? I think it might've been too, was um, in season two, the opening fight with Crease. Mm. So you were, I don't know if you were doing. I didn't the, work on that one. That was episode 201. I came in and did 202. Okay. So that one was one where I was, they had cut it together and they showed me the cut and there was just dead moments in between certain movements. And there was also a couple things that I didn't know if it was a style where there was a punch and then from the cut, it was like a punch and then a repeat punch. And I didn't know if that mm -hmm. was it for effect, but it didn't line up in the cut. It was just like, so it was like a double. And I'm like, is that sloppy or is that on purpose? And I'm like, so I tightened that up and just a couple things in my own edit, just so Johnny looked stronger and it, and it, and it felt it just, the energy was in it. I sent that one in and they did some adjustments on that as well. And that's just, you know, that's just my, listen, especially with this character and with what this is. And, you know, I'm not 18 years old anymore throwing these kicks. So I want to look as good as I can look. So I'm super, you know, invested in it. And mostly I'll do that to show the guys. Like, I don't say, Hey, send this on. I need to see this in the cut. I'll just show the guys. And then if they agree with it, they'll send it on. But I do that a lot. It's part of my process too, just for, you know, cause we're moving so fast, dude. The show is moving so fast. It's a blur by the, by the third, third week, fourth week, you're just like, you know, you're swimming in it. So I like, I just try to make sure these moments are, um, you know, I put everything I can into making it what I hope it would be in my eyes, you know, but yeah, is a full, you know, that's the best thing too, is how, what I learned on it was how, what good hands, what good hands that we're in with you guys what good hands we are with the music, what good hands. I mean, everybody cares and it's clear. So when you pour your heart out and you're playing something and you give it over, you know, and to see it come back, like, did you cut the end of season three too? that last, that did you cut the season? Was it three, uh, three, 10. Yeah. Is that yours with the, the, yes. bow at the end? Oh my God. I'm so glad that you brought that up because Dude. whenever, whenever somebody interviews me about editing and they say, if there is any moment or scene or episode in your career that you're the most proud of now, I've got to tell you the story about the last scene of 310. Yeah. I'm just going to ask you. So go. Okay, good. I'm so glad that this came up because I didn't want to force it, but oh my God, this is one of my favorite moments of my entire career. So for those that don't know, spoiler alert, Johnny and Daniel come together at the end of season spoiler three, alert. if you're right. Um, but essentially in my mind, because I was such a fan of the show, I, who I am is so driven by the themes of the original Karate Kid, having been bullied for years, then learning martial arts, martial arts philosophy is a huge part of who I am, that all of a sudden I'm reading the script, I'm like, whoa, this is a huge responsibility that's partly put upon my shoulders, as I'm sure you felt and everybody else in that scene felt. Anybody that's lived in this world, we've been waiting for this moment for over 30 years. And I was watching the dailies thinking like this, this has got to be the moment we've been building to this for so long. It can't just be like, oh, great. They're together and cut to black end of season. Mm -hmm. So Josh was the uh, Josh Heald was the director of that episode. And I think either co-writer or he wrote it as well. I can't remember but he had written a very specific song into it. And it was a song from Queen. And as soon as I listened to the song, I'm like, no, this is totally not right. This doesn't feel like what this moment needs to be because ultimately what I, and this is what I tell uh, people in the editing world all the time, as editors, we are painting with emotion and our job is to create moments. It's not to cut together dailies or scenes or sequences. We create moments. This moment has to hit. So I called Josh, I'm like, dude, I love you. This is the wrong song. Is it okay if I dig around to see what I think is gonna work better? He's like, we totally trust you. You do whatever you need to. So I started thinking to myself, like, what is like the biggest moment, the biggest crescendo? If you wanted to think about this, this gigantic build of any 80s song, what is it? 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 And I'm like, oh, I know what it is. It's Phil Collins in the air tonight. And I start searching for it. And all of a sudden I find this alternate version of it by the proto men. And not only is it a great cover, but it has all of the kind of rock and electronic instrumentation underneath that felt exactly like our composers had done it. I literally broke into a sweat when I was cutting it in. I'm like, Oh my God, 
I, I think this is it. I think this is it. I was so nervous. I called my assistant editor in and I was shaking. I was shaking. I was breaking out in a sweat. I'm like, you have to watch this and tell me if I'm crazy because either this is the coolest thing ever or this is going to suck. And I showed him the whole scene and what's in the finished version was essentially my editor's cut. Finished the scene. He just sat there for a second. He's like, dude, yeah, that's the scene. And then I screened it for the guys. One of our, uh, our um, kind of rituals that we have is we screen the editor's cut of every season finale, which is terrifying because it hasn't gone through any notes, hasn't gone through any directors, no writers. Like here's my raw vision in my head. And my hands were shaking as I was screening it with the three of them on the couch in the front of the room. And as soon as it started to build, they started to cheer. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So yeah. all the moments that I've created for the whole series that I feel are in the, the DNA of the show, that's the moment that I'm the most proud of. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It was amazing. I remember them showing me. I knew that was coming. I knew that, of course, we played that moment. And it was really a big moment for both of us. I mean, to finally turn to each other in character because we mm -hmm. both literally become these guys. So, you know, we've always seen each other on the opposite sides of the aisle. And um, I remember seeing that and going, I remember what it felt like. I knew with, with any song it would have been a great moment. But when the guy showed me that with the cut, even knowing what it was like, and we were all like, dude, chills. Like that was, that's it. Like that's, and they told me, they told me how, how you put it in there. And I'm yeah. like, you know, that they surprise him. You surprise him with that. And, but those are those moments where it's super. Yeah. Those are the, those I think are the moments that, that resonate and linger. Like that's a moment in time. I think that, that one scene, that's a beginning of a transition for these characters that's got so much weight behind it with the decades and moving forward. So that's like a turning point for everything. I'm um, the pivot point and you nailed it, man. Yeah. Um, well, I, I appreciate that. Well, yeah, man. I'll, I'll throw it back at you real quick. Cause the, my second favorite moment of the entire series is so God awful boring that nobody would be interested in it, but you, but I, I edited and workshopped versions of this to death. And it was the moment that you gave Robbie a hug at the end of season four. Like oh, that yeah. moment just destroyed yeah. me. I literally, I was in tears watching the dailies and like, I, I can't fuck this up. I cannot screw up this scene because what you guys both brought to it was so good. And I must have cut 15 different versions of that, trying to find what's the timing, what are the pauses in between? Like that scene was just so good. So it's way more boring in the lexicon, but for me, it was such an important pivot. No, moment. no, I loved it. I loved how you handled that. And, um, it, 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 it was really just, I mean, you're, you're so good, dude. Your instincts are dead on the way you went to the, what, even the, the, everything's gonna be all right. The way you cut back out of that to the wide at the end of that and let it live in this empty space, it, it could have been head to head and it could have cut to the next bit. But like, you know, that's what I love is when these moments breathe, you know, we're not just kind of and, and, and that, that just said it, I mean, that could have been, you know, in one way that could have been almost an alternate, final moment of that season too but it would have had a different you know we had to shoot off with crease and and the silver bit but that was its own resolve and that was another monster moment i mean for johnny and for for robbie and the relationship i mean those are the two moments of pivot points and turning points and you're nailing it so continue on please don't well, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. Uh, and this is actually the perfect segue to where I want to go next is talking a lot more about this father son or father daughter relationship because you have both and better understanding how at any level, but specifically at the level that you are at now, how you ascertain if this is an opportunity that I'm worth making sacrifices for or not, because again, if you don't love what you do, well, you don't, uh, you're, you're, it's going to feel like work. And if you do love what you do, you're not going to work a day in your life, but mm -hmm. it's still going to come at a cost, especially now that you've got kids. I can't even imagine saying, Hey guys, I'll see you in seven months when the season is over. Like I have a hard time if I'm going to be gone for two days. And so I don't, I don't, I can't even imagine what it is that you must go through knowing that you and I have kids that are essentially the exact same age. Um, how is it that you decide what's an opportunity and what isn't? And then how do you just manage the complete and total lack of work-life balance when you're on a show? Yeah, I'm still, I think we're starting to, we finally sort of figured it out. I've never done a series this long. And I, when I did do it work in the earlier days, I didn't have kids. Um, so when we started, I, it was like, Micah, my son was, 
seven and my daughter was four. So it was, uh, it was a little different. They didn't have quite, they weren't quite oriented with time and like the, the time I was away and stuff. But, um, it's, uh, that's, that's a new, that's a new big deal for me is, is that I, I love being a dad. I've been home for a year now since our last, our last show, the show wrapped and I didn't take any work and I had some offers come along the way to pull me here and there for a month or two and do this and that. And I just wanted to go and make up for lost time and dive in and, you know, I'm their coach, you know, in many ways. And, you know, I'm just their, you know, daughter's doing gymnastics, son's doing water polo and uh, guitar and just, uh, you know, I love being hands-on. I love being a father more than anything now. So it's really interesting because when I started, like, you know, my, my dream was to be in the business and all that. When you have children, um, that's just a whole nother compartment of your heart. So for me, how do you, how do you ascertain what's the right move? There's still two parts of it. I mean, there's some in a perfect world and this is what I look for. And, and if everything can line up, it's great. I'm doing a project that they can come and watch me shoot and that ideally they can come to the premiere and they can see this movie. Okay. Most of the things that are out there are not that. So if I'm going to go away for three or four months and say, hey, daddy's over here, but you can't come to the set because it's this theme or whatever, and you're never going to watch this movie until you're 18 or whatever, you know, those are considerations. However, that's not the final thing, because there are decisions that I'll make that are purely career oriented and stuff like that. But my perfect world is it's like everything fits in where I go and work and the doors open on both ways and I'm and it's and it's open. And um, so I'm looking for something that's, you know, um, that fits with the whole, the whole big picture. Um, but it is, it's hard. It's hard being away. It's, it's, you know, we're bracing for it right now. They've gotten really used to me being around and being there, you know, throwing the ball to them in the backyard and, you know, helping them with their homework and getting them to bed every night and the barbecues and the whole thing. Like, you know, I've been a full-time dad for a year and it's just awesome. Like if I could, you know, and I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss, I don't want to blink, you know, and, my kids in college and go, Whoa. So I said, it's play by play, but they're, they're, they're acclimated to this lifestyle now. And they're, they're like, they're okay. And I think there's something good about them. Like when I leave and I do these things, I say, Hey, listen, we all have our missions. Like you have your mission to go knock out school, get your sports done. You know, that's your job, you know, mom's jobs to do her business and also to make sure you guys do your stuff and dad has a job. So like, you know, my kids were in play. So it's like, okay, you guys are doing wizard of Oz. Like you got your rehearsals, you know, while you're rehearsing, daddy's over here. So I try to make it like, we all have our missions and there's something that happens too, where, you know, when I, when I do step away for a minute, although come sometimes it's too long, it builds character in them because they find their own selves and their own strengths and they learn, you know, in a new way. So I just try to keep it all positive and, you know, and, and then I have, you know, my wife and I discuss every opportunity that comes through and, um, you know, and I've been really so committed to Cobra Kai that, you know, I just, I, I'm, I've been laser beam focused. And I think just now at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to throw a net, uh, throw my line in the future and see what's out there. So there's all kinds of things coming and, you know, I'm looking through and have to weigh them all. And some of them are just amazing movies and amazing parts uh, that the kids wouldn't really be a part of. Um, but in a perfect world, it's something where, um, you know, I can share that because again, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. It's a really a tricky thing because you blink, you know, my daughter, would, you know, FaceTime me at one o'clock in the morning when I'm on, on location, I have to get up at four and all of a sudden, brr, you know, daddy, I can't sleep. Can you just put your phone next to your pillow? And, and I'm like, yes. And, you know, we pass out together and, you know, but it's like the first, usually, usually the first week, the first few days are the hardest. And then I come home. So, you know, it's anytime I get a break, I'll, I'll get home to see them and they come visit. It's a, it's a balancing act for sure. Um, you know, I'm in my gift, I'm in my dream and I'm encouraging them to find theirs. So, you know, one day you will be doing what you dream of doing and you'll work towards. Um, so I'm, I'm modeling that for you. 
looking at all the the decisions that you've made, obviously Cobra Kai is a no brainer. You've gone a year, you've decided I don't want to take the following shows, but you know, take the, the legal obligations aside and it's a c- continuing series. It just seems to me that Cobra Kai is a no brainer. You figure it out, whatever it takes. Well, you know, if we have to move or you guys have to travel every other weekend, th- that's one of those things where yeah. there is no discussion of, gee, should I go back to Cobra Kai or shouldn't I? You just, you figure out how to make it work because that's kind of the, the dream opportunity, the lifetime opportunity. Right. But now we're done with Cobra Kai, right? In, in your own words, we're going to time travel forwards to where right. now Cobra Kai has wrapped mm-hmm. and more opportunities are coming your way. It's a little bit more complicated about whether or not you should take it. And I know that very early in your career, you got some really good advice about basically here are the three criteria to figure yeah. out if this is something you should work on or not. So help people better understand and give them some questions that they can ask when they're deciding, is this opportunity worth the costs that come with it? Yeah. 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 And before I say those three things, um, you know, with Cobra Kai, before Cobra Kai, there was sweep, the, sweep the leg. Did you ever see the music video sweep the leg? Uh, I think I have seen it, but uh, I know what I, um, I'm, I'm going to make sure to, I'll put a link in the show notes for it. For right, sure. So, right, so just the, I'll go backwards for a second. So um, this band, this great guy, Pete Mitchell wrote a song called sweep the leg Johnny and his band was no more Kings. And I met this great, this great uh, man producer um, on the label said, want you to be in a music video. I said, if I write it and direct it, I'll do it. He said, sure. It, it became like, I played me trapped as Johnny and all the original Cobras came back and Ralph and, and um, it wasn't me playing Johnny, it was me being Billy trapped as Johnny. And it was this really fun thing. So at that moment, I was, it was the first time I went face forward back into the Karate Kid universe and played Johnny again in any capacity. And once it went out, it went viral at that time. And the response was so great. It was like, whoa, there's like, you know, Cobra Kai knitting classes and volleyball classes and clubs. And like, I didn't realize the audience that was out there. So I had, I had kind of got like this thing, like, Oh, it's not done yet. There's more to it. And then I was so fortunate to be invited to be on How I Met Your Mother. And they did this great, I got to come on as, you know, Barney Stinson, love Johnny Lawrence and thus me. And I got to do a whole season nine with them in this arc. And it was just like churning. There was something there. So what I mean is at one point I was sort of pregnant with the vision that that something's not done with this yet. I'm not done quite with this character. So when Josh John Hayden came to me with the pitch, it was, I was so pregnant and ready for, I was like, just fertile maybe, you know? And I walked away going, you know, I don't know if this really happens. This is going to be something, you know, but so now that I've been doing Cobra Kai, um, you know, when you're having a baby or raising an infant, you're not really thinking about your next one. Cause you're like, dude, I gotta, you know, change the diapers. And I'm like, we're on the other end of that now. So I'm ready to be, you know, sort of pregnant with a new vision and a new thing. Um, Early on in my career, I was doing um, The Equalizer with Edward Woodward. And I had just done Just One of the Guys and Karate Kid and European Vacation. And all of a sudden, Back to School pops on the radar. And uh, they offer me the part of Chaz Osborne, who's who's another, you know, villain, antagonist. And I was on set with Edward, and I got to play his son on The Equalizer, the original Equalizer. And incredible. That was... That was um, that was my acting school. I got to work with Robert Mitchum and Richard Jordan and Robert Lansing, Shirley Knight, all these classically trained stars. And of course, Edward Woodward. So I was getting to play just a round person and not a bad guy on that show. I'm on the set with him one day. And I said, I just got an offer to play back to school in this, in another bad guy, but I've already played a few bad guys. And I, he said, well, there's three things to consider. So the first thing is, the script is so good that you would, uh, the part is so good that you would do it for free. Um, and the script is so good or two, the money's right. Or three, it's the people you're working with. He says, if it's one of those three things, then you can consider it. I said, well, it's a couple of those things. You know, it's like the part I can tweak. Like, so I'm like, well, I'm going to do back to school. I'm not playing. I'm not going to play Johnny Lawrence. I'm not going to play Greg Toll. I'm not going to play him the same way. So I actually found a funny way in my mind to play Chaz Osborne, who was really a cowardly lion. I grew my hair long. He puffed his chest out, but at the end he had no bite. And so I, you know, I walked around the prance. I threw a, you know, scarf around my neck. The director of that pulled me aside halfway through shooting and called me into his trailer. He says, Hey man, you're coming off too funny in the dailies. Like, where's, where's the bad guy from the karate kid? I'm like, dude, he's in the karate kid. Like I've done that, but there's three things. So like, you know, the, the material is so great 
that you just have to do it. You need the, you, you want to do it, you know, th- two, the money, you need the money at the time. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and three, the people that are involved, you know, so I look for one of those things. Um, I'm going to add a component to that. For okay, me, well, something that's super important, and it's really the reason that I gravitated to Cobra Kai more than anything, mm-hmm. is that the message is something that resonates with you and your deeper why, and you know it's going to have an impact. Yeah. So the the thing that I love doing with this Optimize Yourself program and I've been doing for years and training people for Spartan races or when I used to teach martial arts, all these things, it's always about I love – putting people outside their comfort zones and watching them. I've seen that switch flip on where they realize, whoa, I haven't even remotely discovered my true potential and I'm capable of more. I see it happen all the time. I love that moment. And Cobra Kai thematically, that's what it is. Let's put you into you know the, the moment where you're facing your darkest fears. So right. the reason that I keep coming back to it, even though logistically just on a calendar, it makes no sense at this point for me to do it. But number one, it's a great show. I love being on it and I love all the people. But ultimately, it's that deeper theme is it's just resonates so much with me and my deeper why. So I'm curious if you're looking at projects beyond just either the money or working with great people yes. or the part, what are the deeper themes where you're like, this is yeah. the message I want to get out there. Here's the impact that I want to have. Yeah, certainly. And those again, that was from Edward Woodward when I was about 21 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, those were the criteria at that moment. Um, you know, ideally, I want to I, I want to tell I'd like to be a part of, of storytelling that, um, first of all, you know, you're we're actors were, you know, a, kind of a, a, a conduit of of humanity. And so so even as a, the character doesn't have to be a hero, he could be a broken antihero or whatever, but anything that's human and honest. Um, so I look for I look for truth, really. Um, I, you know, I, I love comedy. I love drama. I love action. Um, but it's not, there's not like a certain message that I, I want to put out because I think there's, you know, my, my message, if there is a message is to be transparent, to be honest, to be truth seeker. And then, you know, we all have our limitations. Johnny Lawrence has had, has his limitations. He's slowly evolving from a caveman, you know, he's stuck in the ace. He's slowly waking up to new things and watching that form. And then as a, as an audience member, you're watching that and you're, you're going on that ride. Um, so what I love about that too, I I've got so many guys in like comic cons, for instance, that come up to me and literally in tears, grown men that, that they're hugging me because they stopped drinking or they're, they're back with their son that they haven't talked to for so long. Um, that, um, you know, they're, they, they were heartbroken and they, they were the guy that was literally sitting at home and they, made a phone call and called a friend for the first time, an old friend and reconnected. Like, dude, my job's done. Like, <laughs> that's why, that's why I wanted to do this in the first place, you know? So, you know, it doesn't have to be, it's not like what the story is always. It's, it's that I find the truth in the character and that, um, you know, that's, that's all. And that I, I like it. And and I don't know, you know, it's it's on a play by play. Cobra Kai is a great model and it's going to be really interesting to see what comes next because it's a it's a high bar of what I've got to do. And I, and I love that it's, you know, it's working for kids to grandparents. You know, there's a whole demographic there. It's like, you know, families are coming together. I'd like to stay in that zone. I'd like to whatever I do next. Ideally, I'd like to do something that can bring that the family's going to watch, you know, not just mm-hmm. for like the, the badass, you know, 20 plus you want to see me go do this or you know, we'll see. Let's see. So I don't speaking, know. It's, and as far as uh, being a part of those kinds of projects, I'm curious, given that we come back to this theme where we started of being the Renaissance man, does that mean that it is as the actor or is it as the filmmaker, as the director, as the writer, as the composer, as the grip? I mean, you've done it all. Right, right. Um, but like for, for you, what 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 is that next stage where you really want to be a part of it? Because you're a part of so much of the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think all of it. I think, I mean, I, I love acting. I love it. I love, I love when it's right, when it's written right and I can trust it and I can jump in the skin and jump off a cliff. And, you know, I've done so many films where it's like, I've, you know, independent movies, sci-fi movies and, you know, that are just like went off the rails and the, 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 the editing was horrible. And I'm just like ah, screaming, but when you're in good hands and you're in a pocket with this kind of situation, there's nothing better. Um, so that that's something, but yeah, I think, um, you know, I, again, I've been so full with this character and with the show and my responsibility to it that I really, 
uh, it, it didn't have time for any dis- any other considerations too much, especially since I'm when I'm off season, it's all about my kids and my wife and my family. Right. So like there's such a it's like a half a year at least of my life that I'm doing the show and then the promotions and everything. And there's slivers of me. This is my first year in five years that I got to have Halloween with my kids. And I got to be home for my daughter's birthday and I got to see her play live, you know, my son's play. The other times I'm zooming in, you know, or FaceTiming in. So, um, you know, anyway, that the, the, the future, I think it'll be a little bit of all, I think I definitely have stories in me and things that I, I would want to say in in a comedy and a drama. Um, so I don't know, but once, as we're coming to the finish line here, um, for the first time, I'm starting to say, okay, uh, now I can look this direction. And um, and I don't know what that'll be, but I know it's going to be great. I love it. Uh, you've been interviewed countless times by all the the world's best news outlets, magazines, talk shows, et cetera, et cetera. And we've, I believe, had a really honest and authentic conversation. But is there anything else that you don't get the opportunity to share or talk about that's really important to you that we can use to, to wrap it up today? Um, I would just say, you know, to artists that are there, you know, in whatever capacity, you know, first of all, like I said, we started with this, have the plumb line to who you are, you know, where you start, you know, have your foundation, have your roots, have your family, have your friends. My, my best friends are still the best friends I had since I was a kid. My actual first like best friend when I was in New York, I was, you know, two years old to 10, you know, we're still in touch occasionally, you know, but all my, I have the, the same best friends I've had since I was just moved, you know, moved to California when I was 10 years older, they're still my brothers and my thing, you know, so keep your roots, stay there and, um, you know, and uh, have your plumb line. And then from that launch pad, you know, take your satellite dish to the all things are possible network, shoot it up to the sky and uh, do your part, work hard. And, uh, you know, the, the, the dots will connect. And I heard a great thing one time about like, well, why isn't this happening for me? Like, why, well, you know, why isn't, why am I, why aren't things opening up? Well, sometimes the stage is being set in your life. Like, like, like why, why the curtains aren't opening for me yet? Well, they actually, the stage is being set. Like this guy has to meet this guy. This guy has to write this thing. This guy has to raise this kind of money. This guy's got to do this. And all that's happening on the stage, but you have to be ready. So just trust the process, man. There's a lot of moving parts to your dream in any capacity, whether it's this industry or anything. So, um, you know, I think, you know, rest easy, I would say, you know, and, 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 and don't be discouraged. It's easy to be, it's really easy to be discouraged. Um, but reach out, step out of your comfort zone, or challenge yourself. You know, the things you're most afraid of are probably things you should step in and do. Mm. once you know, again you and i totally on the same page except, you know, same don't, page. don't be scaling rocks now you know and no and no with no chords but i mean you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah of course yeah i uh, think so i think that's where you grow i think you grow when you're you know you step out you all oh, every single time i do that you know it's really easy to shrink and to be in your bubble man it's just natural it's human nature to just kind of recoil but like to go ahead and like just step into a situation that may you may be intimidated by or may be uncomfortable by and you'll be surprised at what greets you there. Yeah, that that discomfort zone, that's where your growth is waiting and that's where the 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 true potential lies, but man, it's scary as hell. Yeah. So the 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 advice that I give my students all the time is very similar to what you just said, which is and they hate this advice. Once they've kind of gotten all the the pieces in place and they're going in the right direction, oh, it's not happening yet. And I give them the worst advice ever. I say, just keep doing what you're doing. Oh, but I'm, 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 it's, it's supposed to be happening by now. How do you know? Right. Every every time that I've fallen or failed at something, I'm like, well, when the story's over, this is a really great chapter that's going to make the story that much more intriguing. But I have to be willing to keep the story moving forward. So uh, I'm you and I, once again, totally on the same page. I remember back when it started for me and I was like, you know, I, I'm all in like I feel like I'm a um, an explorer on a ship. Sometimes you're in the middle of the sea, you know, it's like. I, there's no going back. Like, I'm so committed here. Like, I don't know what I do next. Like, you know, like, well, I'm going to go be a doctor. I don't think so. 
you know, I got to this, I, I got to eat, I got to fish for my food, man. And hopefully I'm going to land on an Island somewhere at some point. It's like, but you kind of have to have both feet in. You have to be at least pretty committed, but you also have to be ready to pivot because maybe there's something pushing you back so hard that you're actually really going a, a diff, the wrong direction. And there is a truth to that. So that's why you have your, your base. That's why your friends and your family to help you have an objective eye on that. And they're going to be like, yeah, you know what? I never really thought you should, you know, you're not, you know, you shouldn't be doing this or whatever, you know, trust, trust the people around you too. But, um, but you gotta be, you have to be in with both feet. There's no other alternative for me. You know, it's this or like, I don't know, man, I really don't know. Maybe I have to, I have to pull my guitar out and start a band. Maybe that would be it. Uh, I, I, my guess yeah. is you'd have a built in audience that would be waiting for that for sure. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah. so I, I realized that I've, I've broken my promise of doing my best to keep this to an hour, but damn oh. it, Billy, this conversation was just too damn good that I didn't awesome, want to man. interrupt you and stop you with all the mic drops. Well, you um, can cut it down to a, an hour. You can cut out some, some of the fat. Just make it, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there, there, I was going to say, I don't know what I would cut out. Like I've been totally engaged in this the whole time and cannot yeah, believe man. that we're already at this point. And uh, I'm hoping that my audience feels the same way, but, uh, um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you one more time for answering the incessant emails over and over and over about how important it was for me to have this conversation and share your story again, because I think it's going to have such a positive impact on the right people. Well done, by the way. Well done. Oh, I'm not done. I, this is just to be on. <laughs> I was intending to be drinking this the whole time, but I thought our conversation was too. Um, this, is the, my, this is my Marty Cove uh, flask he gave yeah. me for my birthday one time. Isn't that great? Nice. For anybody that's listening right now, this is a, a cue for you to go on YouTube and watch this because the, the visual aids right now are priceless. Priceless. So All right, we'll, man, it was great chatting with you, man. Yeah, can't we'll thank you enough. Here, you know, let's do, it, let's do it again. Yeah, you see, you I know, would, I would definitely love to do it again. Quarter. My, you know, my my gut says that there the there's something in the the air or the universe that for whatever reason outside of cobra kai might uh, bring us together in the future i have a good feeling too so cool man well thank you so All much right, can't uh, really appreciate your time thanks zach <laughs>